God, we thank you for the opportunity to sift your word. God, as you may, even as I was looking at social media this morning and men are, uh, men are apologizing or, or having words to say about, about human wisdom and things that they've written and realize later is an error, I thank you that we can ground ourselves today in something that isn't. Uh, while we might discern or take the wrong thing from it, that would be on us. So help us today to be attuned not just to the actual words of Scripture, not just to any illumination that you have been able to gift me with during the week, but also let us be attentive to your spirit that pervades this room, your spirit that can inform us where we need encouragement, your spirit that can inform us where we need conviction, your spirit that can tell us when and where we really need to pay attention to one piece, one verse, one aspect maybe that is speaking directly to the situation we have. And God, let us not use anything in the lessons as an excuse for what we want to justify in our lives. Let us sit under Scripture and be humble in a way that lets us deal rightly with all the people that you put in and around our lives. In your name, amen. We're going to already open it in 1 Samuel 26, so I'd like to follow along in your own Bible. We'll have it on the screen behind me. And you guys might have noticed, first off, I mean, you, some of you probably saw this when you came in, and this is not as I threatened a few people for if they fall asleep during the sermon. Um, <laughs> it's sort of, it's like, instead of the hook for the guy on stage, I get to you know, stick the people who fall asleep off stage. Uh, some of you might actually notice, you're like, wait a minute, he's used this prop before. Like, wait, this, is, this, this feels like we've been here. And that's actually, that, that's, that was actually part of the point. Because as we get into this text, those who've been following through 1 Samuel are going to see that it kind of feels like what I like to call the second return of Deja Vu Part 2. <laughs> and so join me as, as we dive in. For those who might not remember, we've been walking through this for 25 chapters, and here we go into the next one. Right, we've had we've sort of this David versus Saul thing has emerged. The, re the king God has rejected is now slowly being, uh, the, the spotlight is shifting to this man, David, who's actually Saul's son-in-law. And yet Saul's very resistant, even though he's previously said, you're going to be king. I recognize God's got this plan. He's at the same time then still getting upset and wanting to thwart it and wanting to take David out. And David has walked this rocky path of depression, hiding in a cave, crying out to God, and now he's got a band of a few hundred men that are running around kind of like Robin Hood and the Merry Men, helping people but not officially sanctioned by the kingdom, and in fact, kind of wanting. And we already even so we saw this point just a couple chapters ago where David was in a cave, Saul came in to relieve himself. A great facet for a Sunday sermon, right? And David could have killed him, was really tempted to, didn't, cut off the corner of the robe, and then later said, I, look where I was, I could have done it. Didn't. And Saul repented and said, you know what, we're good, I'm going to stop doing this. So now chapter 26. <laughs> then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakalah, which is on the east of Jeshimah? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakalah, which is behind the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies. He learned that Saul had indeed come. And David rose, came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zeruai, who will go down with me into the camp to Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to the, to the army by night. And there Saul lay sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground or at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given you your enemy. God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please, let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, 
For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him. Or his day will come to die and he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. And David went over on the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill, with a great space between them. And David called to the army and said to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? And Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die. Because you have not kept watch over the Lord, over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now you see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now therefore, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day, that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Now therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel... He's come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life is precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here's the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord. And may he deliver me out of all tribulation. And Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. God's people said? Amen. But we've already addressed the redundancy in the room. Right? So we had this prop before, but it's apt because we find ourselves in a very similar situation. Just a couple weeks ago, David had a chance to kill him. Friends told him to do it. He didn't do it. Now, Storytelling 101 would say, don't repeat yourself. Storytelling 101 would say, don't repeat yourself. It might even say, don't repeat yourself. <laughs> In fact, it probably even says, don't run this joke into the ground. But Bible critics actually will assail this as a discrepancy in Scripture, as a redundancy in Scripture. And I said Bible critics, and that happened, probably. That's not <laughs> Obviously, it's just, they, uh, they say, obviously, this is just two mythical versions of the same event where somebody's telling a type of a story about David and certain, you know, details change. He cut off the corner of the robe, he took a spear in water. Obviously, it's just variations on a theme. It's a token of the same idea. And here, then, as people are compiling these stories and pulling them together, there's a couple different writers, and they all got mushed into this book, which we now say is first. Samuel. Well, okay, in one aspect, I'll say, I don't think they're wrong. It's either bad storytelling, or it's real life. Or it's real life. In fact, it's part of the same compilation of Scripture that would tell us in Ecclesiastes 1.9, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. 
Right, if, if I wanted to construct a good story, and some of you have complained about this, some of you are watching your favorite TV show, it's getting into season three or four, and you're kind of like, oh, they're just retreading the same emotional arc that the character's going through. Oh no, no, they've created this other character, they're gonna die, then it's gonna, and you're like, that's bad form, we've been down this road before. They keep, they're just repeating themselves, they should cancel the series. Or they should get new writers that can come up with new ideas. Because never in our real lives do we find ourselves standing at the same precipice again that we've been at before, making the same mistake or seeing a friend do the same. Right now, it might not be interesting storytelling, but it's very real life. David says, all day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil in Psalm 56. They stir up strife. They lurk. I love that. They watch my steps as they've waited for my life, for their crime. Will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples, O oh God. He's tired of the same thing happening over and over again. And so it, it seems very, very cheap of all the places that you might take a stab at trying to say Scripture's in error somehow, or Scripture's not true stories, to pick out something that's actually more like real life and say, it's bad storytelling. Well, I agree. It's bad, it's bad fiction because it's not fiction. Bible critics love to complain about a lot of things, and they love to pick and choose. In fact, sometimes they will take things that are improbable and say, this proves it's false because it's impossible. There's a difference between improbable and impossible. You know, we're studying through Jonah right now, and people, some, some people, have, they, they hit a rock in a hard place. They're like, I just can't believe... I mean, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, but I just don't believe a guy could survive three days inside a fish. I mean, I believe a guy walked on water, and I believe a guy who decayed for three days in the ground suddenly sprang miraculously back to life, but fish, way too far. <laughs> like, the, the same physics that have to be undermined by my understanding of Jesus walking on water, I believe that, but then I have a problem with parting the Red Sea, all right, if I'm going to believe that God can interrupt what I would understand as the norm operation of the universe that he created, the smallest thing, you know, if, if he parts my cereal bowl and the milk moves from side to side, or it's an entire ocean, it's still outside any normative understanding of operation apart from him. Sometimes, and in this case, we're not even talking about something that seems impossible. It's just, this would happen twice. The same guy would make the same mistake, hunt him twice, they'd have a similar circumstance twice. That's, that's maybe at best improbable, far from impossible. How many of you have had the same thing happen more than once? All right. I mean, you know what? I've gotten a speeding ticket before. I'm just confession time. I went faster than I should. I got pulled over by an officer. He gave me the speech. I learned my lesson. Thank God that's never happened twice. <laughs> or three times. Right? If art is supposed to imitate life, then whoops, this is actually what we do. And what should we expect from the Bible ultimately? Good storytelling or real life? Maybe some redundancy, which seems boring, because that actually is kind of like my life sometimes. In fact, another book in that same compilation reminds us there's nothing new. So seriously, what did we expect? If you're determined to prove something false, you'll nitpick things like this in the book. And eventually, if you want to prove something false, and it's really your intention going into it, you'll eventually show your cards by taking something improbable and saying it's impossible, and there's a difference. The improbable can happen. But enough about the text. Enough about the text. Let's get into the text. Because we start with those Ziphites. Man, these guys really kind of tick on. The Ziphites, once again, they're the guys that go to Saul. Hey, that David guy's down here. Remember you wanted to get him? Remember how angry you were that time before? I mean, he's hiding. Doesn't that mean he's up to something bad? Psst, hey, Saul. There's that guy. Saul takes 3,000 men, and he's going down there once again with his intention. Have you ever had that happen to you? Or maybe you've been on the delivery end 
where someone actually decides they're just going to back down and back off, and then somebody winds them back up again. Somebody stirs up all those emotions. David talks about this. They lay in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O oh Lord. People get stirred up. This is, sometimes we do this, and then when somebody else goes and commits grievous acts, we like to get upset at them. How many times have we been the wind-up? Or how many times have we allowed ourselves to get wound up? Stirring up strife is talked about in your Bible quite a bit. It's like the poison of Iago speaking into Othello's ear. Right? Loki stirring up his brother Thor in myths to disobey their father. Stirring up strife. And some of you like to justify this. And I'm not saying there's never a place for it, but we have to be really careful that we don't justify ourselves. I've talked, had some conversations. In fact, I think I've probably even been that guy. Like, well, you know, I'm just the kind of guy who likes to mix it up. I'm just like the guy, I like to just walk into the room and just sort of drop a conversation bomb and boom, there it goes. I think we have to be more cautious than that if we love God and listen to his word. Psalm 56, they stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath, cast down those people. We have to be careful and when we think our stirring is kind of fun, it's not more like a witch stirring a cauldron of trouble. Second Timothy in the New Testament, we jump forward from David, says, Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. That's maybe a question for some of us this morning. Do we stir up strife? Or do we have a friend that could use a very loving sit-down to talk about how they incite your community? So I don't think our responsibility ends if I just clean up my own. I have a brother I truly, truly love. I've got to be careful about that speck, log, whatever it is in my own eye. That doesn't mean I don't have an honest conversation, a concerned conversation. Psalm 140 says, Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. I think the number one way that I see this today, of course, is the also innocent status update, right? What's on your mind? That thing I know is going to polarize, get me a lot of likes, and an equal number of incited friends. Let us consider how to stir one another up. Hebrews 10 tells us to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, some of you aren't Facebook people, and some of you actually do that thing where you have a face, what's that, face to face, right? That's the, where you're actually in the same room. But either way, am I asking myself these questions before I speak? Will it stir up, am I going to stir up others? To love? Will it stir my followers to good works? Will it encourage? Do I think those through I, I've I found myself like David in a much less volatile situation. Instead of a spear through a head, it's just a button clicking post. Delete. Right? Don't be a ziffite is kind of one of our first lessons. Don't be polarizing people who should be civil to one another, who should be brothers one to another. Don't pour accelerant on the fire. Spreading inflammatory, usually hyper hyperbolized news. It's a, maybe even it's a grabby headline that's about 80% accurate, which means it's 20% lie. Whipping everybody into a tizzy. Because God sees what we do. And sometimes we all are Ziphites in need of repentance because we've stirred up a soul. Maybe not to go there and try to kill a son-in-law. Hopefully not. But maybe in the heart, that feeling which we're equally guilty of. Titus 3 would say, avoid quarreling. 
Some of you are just like, yeah, but I, I like to. Well, maybe there's a place for it. Maybe there's a time for iron to sharpen iron with somebody, with a good friend, or with the right, with the right core of people who can get into it and then hug and go home loving friends. But maybe when the scripture tells me repeatedly, avoid quarreling, avoid divisive talk, avoid these things, maybe, maybe I should second guess when it just feels like it might be a good idea. Be gentle, show perfect courtesy, avoid foolish controversies. I'm trying to, we're really trying to train down all the volatile conversations I get into about whether movies were good or not. You know, you see, I mean, really of all the things we could be talking about having divisive conversations, whether or not Suicide Squad was a good movie, is just like, that seems like a waste of my time. You didn't enjoy it? You, you hated it? Awesome. You loved it? Awesome. Let's just, let's do something. Let's not be there. If we're going to have a quarrel, let it be about maybe something more fundamental to life. Titus 3 says this for a person who stirs up division. This is where it gets tricky and even harsh. After warning him once and then twice, I have nothing more to do with them. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, self-condemned. Those are some pretty harsh admonitions for those of us who have or still will on face future occasions of wanting to stir. It's like, what do I want to stir again? Is this going to stir that, that which God thinks is the right stirring? Am I in error? Should I just shut up? I would certainly hate to be on the relational end of that being as the one who deserves to have nothing Somebody have nothing more to do with me. In this case, they stirred up Saul once again to try to kill David. David, of course, goes down with Abishai, and they're standing over him. You know, spears stuck in the ground. It's just like, you know, it'd just be pretty easy to just pick it up, put it down, because we got Saul, he's sleeping not so beauty, right? Abishai says he'll go down with him. Saul's sleeping within the encampment. Got the whole army laying around him and nobody wakes up, which like, well, that doesn't seem probable. Well, then scripture tells us God actually, they're in a God-given stupor. And so here it comes. It could be very easy. Just take that spear, wake up, time to die, right? Or just never wake up at all. And here we go once again, we have advice from a friend, and something that even references God. This is somebody giving what they think is godly advice. It says, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Let me pin him to the earth with one stroke. You don't even have to do it, David. I'll take care of it. Just give me the word. David's response is, well, hold on a minute. How about now? Right? Just, no. Do not destroy him. Who can do this and be guiltless? It says the Lord will strike him. The Lord put him into position. The Lord said he would take care of the situation. This is not a case where I feel like I could have, I could take some spiteful revenge, but it is not my place. As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, and he will go down into battle and perish. David may or may not know it at that moment, but he's being prophetic. And we'll get to that in a few weeks. Take now the spear in his head. Let's take tokens that show that what we have the, where we've been and what we could have done, and let's go. And here's something fascinating. Here we see something different. Because David does ask a few questions the last time. David does. This time, once he was tempted to take things into his own hands, and he floundered a little bit. Tempt me once, I flounder, I gotta think about it, I wrestle inside, but maybe I succeed. And then we see, now we've come to the next time, He's tempted tempt me twice, I've grown. It's a simple no. Simple no. I will not do this. Kind of asks that question. I think we, I, I like to do this in my own personal life. I just ask myself, how, am I facing temptations I faced 10 years ago? And when they come to me, do I, do I see any of that? Do I see God's progress of sanctification my heart, my mind, my soul. If I've given myself to him and he's filled me with his spirit, do I, do I see some fruit? It doesn't have to be a huge thing. Maybe last time, maybe, maybe last time, I, maybe three times back I was tempted to sin, I sinned. 
had to repent. The next time I hesitated, the next day I went ahead and sinned again. The next time I struggled and I was actually able to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to give in, I'm not going to speak, I'm not going to do, I, I'm not going to sin. And it was a real struggle. It took everything that I felt God had put in me. And then a friend comes up and tempts me for the same thing, and now maybe somewhere in my life I'm just like, no. Like the taste for it's actually waning. The desire for it is like my taste buds for certain things that have shifted over time. It's just not there. That's a joy, isn't it? Some of you experience this. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because if somebody's struggling to remember, and sometimes that's, that's maybe where we can do a self-test. Maybe if we're getting worried, we talk to our friends. Have you seen change in me? You know, I feel like I've just, I've never grown. Like I gave my life to Christ 20 years ago. I still feel like it's exact, like a flat line of just hanging on there. Like, well, you know, others might have seen something in you. Others might have an edifying word for you. This is where community and conversation sometimes comes in. And also vulnerability. Because you know what, if I ask you, like, have you seen change in me? And they're like, eh, a little bit. Like, oh, that's disheartening. I kind of, I want to just say, dude, you are night and day. It's like, no. But you know what, I think about most of the people I know. Have I seen re-stumblings? Sure. But most of the people I'm close to in Christ, I can see places where ten, I've known them for a decade, you know what? I see like, new areas of unexplored trouble emerge, and so there's, there's pitfalls. Sure. Is it just an like, even line that just sort of that keeps arcing up toward perfection? No. It's more like one of those jagged ones, right? But can I see an upward trend? That's encouraging. Can I trust that he's got me on that, even on the days where it feels like I just fell down? Do I see and actually discern like David? Here we can see him growing in the Lord. No hesitation. He's making progress. And so he goes over to the other side of this great chasm, and here's where there's a really sad part to the story. Here we see him go across. There's a chasm between David and Saul, and they have a conversation. It's a great space between them, it says. First he mocks Abner, right? The guy's supposed to be protecting him. Like, uh, technically you deserve to die. Like, you had one job. You had one job, I got saw spear and jar. You know, I, like, that should tell you something. Either you're really bad at your job and you deserve to die, or God was doing something. Maybe God's trying to tell you something. But Saul recognizes David's voice. And he says, is this your voice, my son? It's, it's such a deep, like, you can't even see. It's like, I can see, you know, I can, I can tell that's, if I have my contacts out, I would not be sure, I would be mostly sure that was Catherine at the other end of the room. But it'd be fuzzy, right? But Catherine, is that you? Or is this just sort of a, another similarly dark-haired clump? It's because without, without contacts, everything just becomes fuzzy. So it's so far that you can't quite be sure that's the person you know. He has to, it, that's, how, that's how wide the chasm is between them. He says, is, it, is, that, is that your voice? Is that you, David? Is that? So it is my voice. Why do you pursue me? What have I done? What evil's on my hands? And then he says this too. I think it just goes all the way back to our Ziphites, right? He says, if it's the Lord who stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it's men, may they be cursed. Like, did, did men stir you up to kill your son-in-law? Really? It is men. Again, with the stirring. And woe to those who do it. This is where we see the, fr the friction and the factiousness, and we need to dwell on that a little bit today. 1 Timothy 6 talks about it. talks about the man who is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. Why? He has an unhealthy craving for controversy. Quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil, suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Saul's been incited to the whole thing. David's going to take everything from me. All my gain will become loss. He's been whipped up, stirred up, constant friction. And the most tragic thing is we hear Saul's words and we see David's discernment. Because Saul says, I've sinned. Return, my son, for I will do you no more harm, because my life is precious. 
in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly. I have made a great mistake, he says. Return, David. Come, like, bring, you know, cross that chasm. Come back to me up to the other side of the hill. Hand me the spear. We can hug. We can do all these things. And David answers with a nice big cup of milk. David answers and says, here's the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. You want it? Send someone over. You stay there. And I stay here. Saul then again, blessed be you, my son David. You'll do many things and will succeed in them. I'm wishing you well. To some of us, this might be feeling a bit wrong as we look at David. I mean, Saul said all the repenting words, right? If David is a man of God, doesn't he have to forgive? the answer is yes. Doesn't David have to show Saul grace? I'm going to surprise you a little bit and suggest not in the terms you might be thinking. This gets said a lot, and I did a lot of research. It's become a very trendy phrase, which if you actually go and look for in Scripture, you're not going to find. I've heard a lot of, it's on, the, it's on the, my lips. I'm probably going to try to kill that. It's on a lot of our lips. And see, the thing is, as a guy who grew up big on grammar and English major and all that, like, words matter. And sometimes words are close enough. I mean, you know, sin, you, you do the synonym drift. You sort of, well, this word kind of means this, which kind of means this, which kind of means this. You do that far enough, suddenly the word doesn't quite mean what you really want it to land on. And there are a lot of people that say, oh, come on, you, you need to give people grace. Or sometimes people are like, hey, you need to give me grace here. I actually found a blog post by a, an insightful woman named Rebecca Davis as I was poking around. And she said, how can I give grace? I can't. I don't mean I'm incapable unless God's helped me. Or I don't mean I'm incapable unless God helps me. I mean giving grace is a prerogative of God alone and I have no part in it. It's, unpopular. it's popular now to talk about how we need to give grace to others. But the way people are using the word meaning forgiveness Kindness, love, diminishes the meaning of the remarkable word grace until it loses the vital meaning it should have. In all the New Testament, nobody gives grace except God. That phrase is not found. We're told to love our neighbor as ourself. But does that mean, does loving my neighbor as myself mean that they get carte blanche for unmerited favor in temporal circumstances? No, it doesn't. That would mean if somebody was unqualified for a job position, I'd have to hire them. Give me some unmerited favor. Well, okay, you're totally not qualified. You work at McDonald's, you can be CEO. If somebody's unqualified for church leadership, well, then I have to put them in. If somebody, see, unmerited favor is a tricky thing. And one aspect of it, just like vengeance, is God's alone. I would ask, we might want to try to quit talking in terms of grace because the Bible doesn't express itself in those terms. And we might be blurring the lines to where then somebody actually gives unmerited favor to somebody who is harmful and hurtful and repeatedly abusing them. And that's not healthy either. Grace is, according to B.B. Warfield, free, sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. Well, I got news for you. I'm not sovereign. So I might give you kindness. I might give you forgiveness. I might give you something you don't deserve. But I'm not sovereign, so giving grace as the Bible understands it, that's actually saying a lot about me, isn't it? Surely I will dispense thee some grace, my dear brother. <laughs> Hopefully somebody would give me a different type of grace if I ever did something like that. Jerry Bridges would say, "God is grace is God reaching downward to people who are in rebellion against him. Even when somebody may have sinned against me, ultimately they're sinning against a holy and righteous God, and I leave the vengeance to him. So whether or not they're going to receive future unmerited favor belongs to him alone as well. Even in the dictionary, just a simple Google search, I looked at it, the grace says, the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. 
Those things belong to God alone. Just as God is patient and forgiving, he wants his children to be patient with and forgiving of others. Don't get me wrong. Colossians says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And if somebody is truly repentant, Matthew 18 tells us about ways in which we go to them and we are truly, we are obligated to forgive. Forgiveness, however, as many commentators and many theologians will aptly point out if we study, forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. Forgiveness is between our heart and God's, removing any barriers that unforgiveness brings. But when someone continues to unrepentedly violate another person's boundaries, a wise person learns to set firmer boundaries. Even as we just read about the divisive person, it said warn them once, then warn them a second time, and then what? Give them grace? No, it said have nothing more to do with them. Giving someone a second chance means they're given another chance to earn trust. It doesn't mean that we instantly forget what experience has taught us. This is what we see David doing. In fact, if you wanted to do a deep dive study, we also like to throw around things about how God will, he erases our sins and he remembers them no more, which is a scripture. I'm not denying that, but the potency of that scripture and the idea of remembering, especially in that context and language, has more to do with saying, hey, if you erase a debt, it's not technically that you, you don't, it's like, I, you owe me money? When? I don't even, no, it's just the lack of remembering means the erasure of any weight that it has. I don't think I, I don't read in scripture in its fullness and understand an all-knowing God and think that actually someday in heaven I'm going to be like, hey, remember God in that time? Like, no, what are you talking about? I don't remember what he said. When? What? Where? Like, he's, it's not as if he loses memory. He chooses to not remember it in any efficacious relational ways. But that's a deep dive study. So he literally make himself forget. It's hard to prove that with scripture. So too, in our day-to-day -day circumstances, if somebody has hurt a dear friend of mine three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, I can't go to that person and say, hey, this is a pattern. It's like, oh, no, you forgave me last time. You have to forget. No, I see a pattern and you're hurting somebody I care about. And you know what? We overlooked it the first time. I talked to you kindly the second time. The third time, a couple of us came and really sat down and, and just like, man, we, this is a problem. And at some point then, relationship may end. Because second chances are no longer working. Now, if I've wronged someone, I also shouldn't use grace like it's an ax I can hit them with. Right? When we've wronged someone, we have you, you, you say you're a Christian, you have to give me another chance. Like, really? Wow. Well, I'm not sounding like a Christian right then, am I? I should want to humbly, in a repenting way, do everything I can to let them see a change in my heart. And you know, that might start with words like Saul. I might have to start with words, but then hopefully life lives it out in the actions as well. You have no right to demand that chance. And sadly, there may come a time in human relationships when the same things occur, when forgiveness has been offered, restoration made possible, but one party refuses to repent. And it may be time that that relationship ends. And some of you have been through this, and some of you have been and then wrestled. Is this right? Is this wrong? Should I have? Should I have? Should I? Could have? Would have? We wrestle with these things, and sometimes culture can load us up with blurry ideas of our biblical understanding, and it's like, well, I need to wrestle with the full context of Scripture and the full weight of relational interaction between God's people and one another, between Jesus and his disciples, between the disciples in the book of Acts. There are lots of things where one Scripture out of context might trip me up. Maybe I would cut off somebody too harshly. I could get a proof text for that. Maybe I could let somebody continue to hurt me and those around me because I have another verse that I'm taking out of context. We need a full context of Scripture as we wrestle with these things. Now, it's not Scripture, and in fact, it didn't originate in Star Trek, but I think as a young kid, I learned in an episode as Mr. Scott was talking to Mr. Sulu, he said, fool me once, shame on you. 
fool me twice, shame on me. It, what's happened here is David has been pursued and hurt by Saul repeatedly, more than once, and now this is the second time, right? This started with spears being thrown at him in the court. And we've reached a point in a relationship where David won't get fooled again. The chasm will never be crossed, in fact. This side of eternity. In fact, this is the last time they converse. And that should hurt. I should think that hurt David. Like, I slew a giant for God primarily, but also you, like, you were my king. Although it was for God first and foremost, like, I slayed a giant for you. I played music for you, you when you were oppressed by savage thoughts and a spirit. I took your daughter's hand in marriage. Your son is my best friend. And this is the last time we will ever speak. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. Some of us may have to hit those crossroads in life. And hopefully we have, David had a host of men around him that loved him. And in fact, last chapter we saw, I mean, he also took Abigail as wife. He has some comfort. He has relationships to turn to in light of that tragedy and that sorrow. But it needs to be done. 2 Timothy 3, avoid such people. It says people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Sadly, that fits Saul to a T. He has the appearance of being God's king, and yet has repeatedly rejected and denied what God asked. Second Timothy 3 also says these people are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. I pray for everyone here that that, that sentence would never be us. Never be us. And some of you can really well, no, I, I've been, I, I have and am burdened with sin. Occasionally I get led astray by a, by a passion. And sometimes I have learned some stuff, but it hasn't really taken root in a reality way of living it out in truth. Why don't you just put us on our knees again? Ask God to continue to equip, change, humble, and strengthen us. But I don't know of many in this room, because I know many of you, who only say all the right words, and there's no evidence of I fear for people who seem to be in a season where maybe we, we fear or question that. We lose sleep over that. We wonder about some people and say, well, no, I care about you. And you think about David thinking about Saul. Like, how did you get to this point? Why is this happening? Why can't I be best friend to your son and have a great relationship with dad? It really stinks. But here we see Saul saying all the right words. As 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11 reminds us. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Saul says, I've sinned, I've acted foolishly, I've made a big mistake. Blessed be you, David. And he, he goes away, but we never are brought to understand by Scripture that his heart was ever in the right Where are you being strengthened against temptation like David? I hope some of this can be a good question for conversation between friends and spouses or during the week or as you guys get together for coffee or tea. Where do you think you're actually, where can you see in your life like David? Even if it's just incremental, tiny. 
Now remember, I feel more strengthened against this type of temptation, this type of urge than I have previously in my life. Where do I see that God is at work in my heart by His Spirit? Or just in discernment, whereas maybe somebody tried to give you some seemingly godly advice, and you're like, oh, I don't know, does that sound right? Is that what the Bible says? Or what? And then maybe another time now, somebody's giving you some godly advice. It's like, well, that's not an untruth, but it's not an application to what I need to do right now. See, sometimes the discernment isn't just black or white, true or false, but applies to me in this situation, yes or no. And where do we need to seek some genuine repentance? Maybe we do have some soul spaces in our life. Maybe we do have a lot of places we keep saying words and words and words and words about how we're so this or so that, but it doesn't actually translate to living that. Maybe we just need some renewed dedication. You know, I always wondered where they got that saying, that the illustration in Scripture that you probably heard if you ever talked to an evangelist. They, they draw the chasm, and, and they're like, Man's on one side, God's on one side, and how do we actually, who bridges that gap between broken, sinful man who is destined to go into the chasm apart from God, and then they draw the cross. I've, I've, I've had that explained to me. I've used that. I never thought of it in context to God's Old Testament and this moment here between David and, and the king of Israel. Here they're standing I wonder if this didn't inspire a bit of the parallel and the metaphor of how the real chasm is bridged. Because we have David looking across the chasm at a king who offers no hope, no true hope of reconciliation. Even angry, we have a king who is angry at his son for being David's friend. It's a portrait of a divide and the insufficiency of Saul. And the insufficiency of Saul here, I don't think, is to illustrate the necessity of David. The insufficiency of Saul is illustrating the necessity of Christ Jesus. The only son sent from the only father capable of reconciliation of that chasm. Capable of giving us righteousness and restoration to eternal life as he promises his children. That's a God I can step out into the chasm with a sure foundation. That is a God who says, come across to me and lay down your spear, and I can say gladly. That's a God who I can put aside my vengeful desires like David has and just wait on him and his timing for all purposes under heaven to take care of the things that I think are injustices. In that case, the spear belongs to Jesus. The spear of vengeance belongs to God and God alone in his Son, the only one righteous to judge, Jesus. And he will use it someday. And he can use it someday because he first took it in his Son, buying us back by his blood. The spear belongs to Jesus. He both took it on behalf of all who put their faith and trust in him, and those that are outside of that refuge of beautiful belief in our loving God and Savior, that spear will have a future purpose that I wish for none. So I'm going to pray for us. I thank God for all those I know here who, who do believe and are seeking to struggle and see how God is growing us as he's grown David in the course of this book and this scripture. I know our ushers are going to take the offering so they can come forward and we can pray. And those who've brought some free will offerings to give can just put those in the buckets as heart has led, cheerfully and sacrificially. And maybe this is weighty for some of us. Maybe, maybe this does make some of you reassess your relationships, and it could go either way. Maybe there is someone that needs a different discernment in your life. And maybe that's actually that you haven't even given them one or two or three loving David kind of chances. Maybe they need renewed relationship with you. Or maybe you've been the one that's been cut off because you actually need to repent of something. And you need to go back to them in a humble and repentant way because they've, they're avoiding you with good reason. I don't know. And maybe for some of you, there's a hurtful person that you need to consider the weight of some of these verses as David's reached an end point with Saul. 
I thank God that his perfect patience and perfect provision in Christ means that I have not met that point with him by his grace. By his unmerited favor, surely he's brought many in this room into relationship with him and love. And so God, as we prepare to respond this song to you, Maybe for some of us, this is just a good encouragement of actions we have taken throughout the course of our life. Maybe this is affirmation, and you actually are putting a song in our hearts. And for those in this room that can sing out for us with joy, I pray that they would do that as we, as we take an offering, as we sing to you. Let those who find this an affirming passage, a confirming passage, sing loudly for those who need meditation, for those who need contemplation, for those who maybe the most sorrow in their heart when they look at the relational friction here. For maybe some who have sorrow because of what's happened to them or others. Or maybe where they need conviction because oh, they've been the friction creator. God, help us and sift us. And for those who need to weep or sit silent, let us not be ashamed or embarrassed. Because in you, we stand before your cross. The cross of Christ. And in you, by Christ's blood, all is for you. Those who need repentant hearts today, I pray we just let that bit of crushing that needs to happen, happen. And for those of us that are prepared to sing with joy, let us be an inspiration to those who are laboring or wrestling inside in your name.